welcome everybody. Uh, it's you know great to have uh, so many candidates who have been endorsed by the Four Lakes Green Party with us. And um, also we are recording tonight so that folks who aren't able to make it at this specific time can watch the video and you know find out information on where the candidates stand on the most important issues that are uh, facing us. So um, thanks again for joining us and why don't we jump right into it. So again, we have two minutes for opening statements um, and we'll start with Patrick. Thanks, Dave. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Patrick. I use he, him pronouns. Um, as a candidate and a Four Lakes Green Party member, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, being District 2 Alder since 2019 has been a natural extension of my years of public service and activism. I spent more than a decade as a queer rights, queer rights activist in Virginia, where I marched on military facilities under gunpoint and protested against the then dominant religious right in Virginia. In Madison, uh, after moving to Madison and prior to being Alder, I led neighborhood committees in evaluating develop, development proposals in the Tenney Lapham neighborhood when we used what little leverage we had to push for affordable housing and sustainability features to be included. That struggle continues. Uh, I stepped up two years ago because I felt we needed an alder who knew the district and its concerns and, and had an understanding of city processes and citywide issues. I also had relationships with hundreds, perhaps thousands of my neighbors and those relationships have only grown over the past couple of years. If uh, reelected, I will continue to use my experience and knowledge to look at all issues through a racial equity and social justice lens when drafting new ordinances and policies related to expanding uh, affordable and workforce housing, reducing the harm of our public safety system, providing resources for those struggling with housing, food insecurity and jobs during and after the pandemic and opening city processes to ensure all have access. I hope that District 2 voters will join these efforts by supporting me on April 6th. Thanks, I look forward to the rest of tonight's forum. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so next up we'll hear from Charlie Rowe. But uh, since it's, it might, it might be on. Thank you. I am going to um, really quickly just say that I'm really grateful to be um, endorsed by the Green Party. I purposefully am running as a bipartisan, um, encouraging my neighbors and my local communities to dare a true democracy in Madison and to challenge the status quo and to really rise up and fight against the um, I, I'm going to rein in my words right here and say, we can't allow our city government to become an incubator for paid politicians. And I am really stepping up in my district because I watched people suffer in my district. Um, my neighbors and I have lacked services and we have sought um, our alders help. If you have visited my website or know my personal story at all, um, I know two very different Madisons. I have very strong roots here being raised on the east side. Um, most of my 45 years, I have been involved with National Alliance on Mental Illness and um, working with suicide for survivors. I have worked to um, purchase portions of land to enlarge the Ice Age River Alliance trail that um, some of the people that found it necessary in our current society to leave this world, that's all they wanted was a place for people to walk and re-engage with nature. And I was able to help raise funds to do that. I have been able to work with our music communities, our autistic communities being neurodivergent myself. And I know I'm a dark horse in this, but I really saw a need and I have a background in government, believe it or not. And so I think it was time to rise up and I'm hoping my neighbors join me. Thank you. Okay, next up is Brian Benford. Thanks Dave, thanks Andrea, thanks Sam for putting this together. It, it really is amazing to be here tonight. 
uh, I hope that all of you that are watching and will watch it in the future, uh, I'm sending you all my best wishes and love. So this event is really special for me because when I was elected as alder in 2003, at that time I was the first and only black elected green in Wisconsin. And I gotta tell you, it's wonderful to know that I'm part of history again tonight with this slate of incredible candidates. I'm so delighted to know that I will not be the only one anymore. <laughs> the COVID pandemic has helped lay bare some fundamental inequities, but those underlying disparities were already there disparities in police practices, wide disparities in housing, healthcare, and education, and access to clean air and water, massive inequalities in how wealth and resources are distributed. We want a community where our access to resources is not determined by our race, income, or zip code. We are tired of living in a community that is divided. I know and everybody else knows that everyone else does better when those most vulnerable and marginalized do better. I know I'm not the only one here tonight that imagines something other than tent encampments in our parks, something other than ear shattering noise of an $80 million fighter jet flying over low income neighborhoods, something other than a minimum wage that doesn't even cover your rent. Madison, I know we can do better City government is key to building the community we want. I want to help the city of Madison move deliberately forward to address the disparities in concrete ways. I know how to do that because for over 30 years, I've dedicated my life to the service of those that are most marginalized in our community. As a former Madison Alder person, president of the city of Madison's Equal Opportunities Commission, as a family advocate, educator, and activist, I have served children, parents, families, and communities to reach their full potentials. Long before the uncertain times brought on by COVID-19, I have fought tirelessly to provide a voice for those that are underrepresented in Madison. I will continue this fight as next Alder person for District 6. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up is Aomi Abuse. Hi everyone, my name is Iomi Obuse and I'm running for District 8 Alder. I'm a longtime Madisonian. I went to West High School, which is just down the street from the university. I have experience working on the Land and Regulations Committee whilst I was in high school, and I started interning with State Senator Latanya Johnson my freshman year of college. Last summer was on a congressional con campaign for Tom Powell's works, worked with the Movement of Black Lives, which organized the March on Washington in DC and became the executive director for Impact Man, which is a black youth led organization that led peaceful protesting consistently last summer and has also built coalitions in DC, Colorado, and we're still expanding. As an organizer, I saw a hesitation um, within Common Council, and I wanted to mobilize people for progressive legislation that simply wasn't there. So I decided to run, <laughs> and my platform is based on social and environmental justice. Madison will be green by 2030, and I want to continue the fight for justice not only on the ground, but in office by becoming a bridge for the greater Madison community and UW-Madison. Right now, um, during the campaign, we've been holding safe spaces during our events, um, but we actually have a fundraiser uh, that you can donate uh, money and we will be planning a tree on your behalf. Uh, it's just a way of saying like, you know, that's personal. We're gonna be doing the work regardless, win or lose. And so um, we've raised about $520, but if you wanna donate, you can go to IOMI for Alder. I only four, number four, alder.vote and donate and plant a tree. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next up is Juliana Bennett. Hi, um, I'm Juliana Bennett. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a university student and activist and a candidate for District 8 Alder and um, so about me, um, I come from a very like working class family in a small suburb of Illinois. Um, my dad um, is a retired veteran and small business owner and my mom was a nurse for 22 years. Um, and 
honestly, I was just having a conversation with my dad and it really kind of brought it back to me, like how much they've taught me the values of like, you know, hard work and resilience and being able to um, uplift the community. So um, coming to Madison and coming to um, UW, you know, we came here for the new opportunities. And while I'm really thankful to have, you know, graduated from West High and to um, be a, um, in this city, I've also experienced like financial instability and housing insecurity and just that added layer of being a person of color at this predominantly white um, institution. Um, and that coming to the head in this, over this year, um, seeing what's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, that's why like I co-founded the UW Madison BIPOC coalition. Um, and we've been making actionable steps to meet community demands. Um, and the impact that we're making is honestly really incredible to see. Um, we've written and passed legislation um, through our ASM student council. We've held our university administration, including Chancellor Blank herself accountable. And um, that's, but coming to head with the city, I'm realizing like I only have 10 minutes left or 10 seconds left, um, sorry. Um, yeah, that came to head with the city with, you know, the uh, budget hearing. And after that ridiculousness of the COPS grant and how we did not have the full support of Common Council, it's really clear that there shouldn't be any hesitation. You know, it's very clear that we need to be prioritizing BIPOC folks and folks of underserved backgrounds. So that's why I'm running. I will stop talking now. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so next up is, uh, I believe, uh, Tessa. Tessa Echeverria. Yes, hi, thank you for, for having me. So yes, my name is Tessa Echeverria. I use they, them pronouns and I'm running for Alder for District 12 in Madison. Um, I got in, interested in running over fighting against the F-35s. Um, but as 2020 progressed, it became so much more than that as we faced um, COVID and uh, then the protests in the summer. I saw a wave of people looking to run for city council, wanting to make a change. Um, and I see the few people on city council who were fighting so strongly for that, right? Rebecca and Grant, who are both here. Um, and they need votes, right? There are There is a drive in Madison to uh, pass police reform, to move that money, to have participatory budgeting, to change the way we do affordable housing. There is a desire from the population of Madison to do so. Um, and what we need are the votes on council to carry it out. And you see the same four people run up against those votes over and over again. And you think to think um, it's time for us to step up. It's time for community organizers to step up and move into city government if what we want to see are these concrete changes. If we want to see these policies passed uh, then we have to get the people into the seats to do them. So that's ultimately what made the decision to run for me. Um, and I'm excited by over this campaign trail being on so many forums with people where we're, we're all repeating the same issues, right? And we're all coming with slightly different ideas of how we solve them. And that's key, right? Because we need different perspectives at the table so that we can cohere those together and, and come up with a plan. So that's why I'm running. Um, I'm sure we'll get into all the specific issues uh, in the other questions, so I don't want to answer them ahead of time, and, and I'll just pass, yield my time there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so next up is Grant Foster. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Grant. I'm in uh, District 15 on the east side. Um, Really, kind of just want to uplift everything Tessa just said. That was great. Um, yeah, I've been I've been trying really hard over the last two years to um, really work on behalf of community, um, really trying to fight for justice and expand freedom for people, and really, um, really challenge the some of the really significant systems that are in place here in Madison. Um, I think one that's just really been 
stuck in my mind for the last six months or so is the, the real estate state. And it's just been really, um, it's, a, it's a really big thing that touches a lot of areas. And um, we, we do need more people on council to vote the right direction because people have power in this community, know exactly what they want and they know how to get it. And if we do not organize, uh, and if we don't stand up and fight back, they're going to get what they want. So uh, I'm really excited to see all the faces on here and excited to have partners in crime on the council. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And next up is Rebecca Kimball. Thanks. Well, that's a nice uh, segue into why I'm running and why I first ran um, in 2015. And it was because I was concerned about the influence of that big money in politics at the state and national level, having covered it um, as a journalist in, at the state house for four years. And, you know, I just saw just how painful it is when organized people literally have no voice, no influence. And even when organized people turn out, in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, we had no influence. And so I saw that those same dynamics coming for city government. Um, and I knew that folks who, you know, really are committed to democracy and justice needed to get in there and defend and expand that space. And, you know, lo and behold, this election cycle, here it is. It's the, the it's talk about the real estate state, the National Realtors Association are funding this, you know, um, a Better Dane County funding the Madison Area Builders Association to support <clears throat> these ultra conservative candidates such as my opponent and Paul Skidmore and, and others. And you know we've seen billboards going up by other organizations. So this is really unprecedented in, in Madison local politics. And we really need um, the people to be organized, um, working together, voting together, messaging together, uh, for what the community needs. So I've worked on so many things in my last six years. I've worked on police accountability, increasing access to stable and affordable housing, um, open government. And I do it in a way, I do it collaboratively working with other community organizations and initiatives um, and all the time fighting for economic, racial, environmental justice. So how I work is bringing people together to solve problems uh, because I don't have all the answers, you don't have all the answers, but collectively we can come up with the answers for what we need. And we really, really need to work together uh, on city council and in the community um, to, to address these issues. Earlier today, we were talking about- um, Time. Your time, okay. Okay, uh, well, thank you. And we'll get right back to you, Rebecca, with uh, the next question. Um, so I'm uh, so thanks everyone for those opening statements, uh, and I'm going to pass it off to Sam to ask our first question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the first question we have is: In what ways have you been active in your community? How does that experience inform your perspective as a candidate? And as Dave uh, said, we'll uh, go right back to Rebecca for that question. So I've been active in my community in a ton of ways. Um, I, I started out getting, when I moved back, my family and I uh, moved back from Kenya in 2000. I had three little kids um, and then I got divorced. And so I was a single mom with three kids. And um, so I got really involved in their schools um, and at the time, there were, there were attempts to close down Lindbergh School and Blackhawk School, so I got involved organizing um, to keep those schools open. And um, uh, from there, I've, I've gotten involved in many, many other issues in my community, um, through the schools, through um, just political organizing, um, and now on council. Um, like I said, I just really... I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this job because I like being a politician. I want to do this job because the things that people um, need voice in, um, I can help organize that and and bring that organizing power to the council. So that's. I'm sorry. Is it just a one minute thing? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. One minute. Okay. 
question now. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, next, we'll go to Grant. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, the last two years, I've been pretty much given all my energy to, uh, to that work as Alder. Um, previous to that, I, I started also kind of in, in the school when I had younger kids um, organizing with, uh, with parents and advocating for um, the kind of conditions that we all um, wanted for our kids and for teachers. Uh, and then I also, um, prior to, to getting on council, I uh, helped found uh, Madison Bikes, which is a, a local advocacy group really focused on um, making biking safe and accessible for people of all ages and abilities here in Madison. And that's an organization that's really taken off in the last few years. And I feel really proud of, um, of that work. But yeah, then the last two years have just been uh, full blast common council, which is just sort of all encompassing. Thanks. Um, and then we'll go to Tessa for her answer. Um, yes, yeah. So I moved to Madison 10 years ago. Um, and from there, I started volunteering at Rainbow Bookstore, where I met Rebecca <laughs> way back in that time. And then there was the Wisconsin Uprising. Um, and I stuck around, I got involved doing a show at Wart and became entered the Wart Board of Directors for a couple of years. Uh, more recently, I opened, co-founded a uh, community arts and music space on Milwaukee Street called Communication Madison, specifically making an all ages sober space for high schoolers to go and play art and make art, but it's for all ages, right? There, we do a lot of adult shows as well. Um, Obviously, that is temporarily closed due to COVID. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's sort of on the community side. In my particular neighborhood, I got involved in Eakin Park Resistance about a year and a half ago to fight against the F-35 jets in our neighborhood and am currently serving as the co-chair of Madison Area DSA. Pass. Thank you. Um, Iomi? Oh, oh my gosh, where do I start? <laughs> um, so as you guys know, I started organizing whilst I was in high school. And so we were talking about the lack of teacher diversity. And I worked with Edgewood and UW Milwaukee to create more scholarships and talk about more evening classes. So we stopped outsourcing to Milwaukee and Chicago when we have communities members right here ready to go into teaching and, and use the base that we have um, because there was no support system built. Um, I phone banked with Freedom Inc and did events with Urban Triage, United Way, Sunrise Movement. I've advocated for marginalized communities by doing the Painter Pride event and creating virtual safe spaces such as a poetry slam, Impact of Men had self care and a book club where we can learn to be more unapologetically progressive, spoken with high schoolers and 80 kindergartners at Franklin on ways in which they can feel empowered to speak out against injustice they face in their community. Um, but I'll just wrap it up there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next to uh, Juliana. Okay, well, um... I, I echo what a lot of um, fellow community organizers on this call have said, um, and just and I think we can all relate to how much time and energy we put into this. Like I know that I am both a full time student and a full time activist. Um, this with co founding the BIPOC coalition um, this year. Um, we first co-organized the March on Madison event, which brought together hundreds of people to march for Black lives um, and put forward the 10 BIPOC student demands, which we've been making actionable steps to meeting. For example, we um, passed the vote of no confidence in UWPD, um, passed the grading. Um, we, were, we got um, the university start paying telecommuting international students. Um, and we became like the first organization to receive um, two consecutive two um, consecutive meetings with Chancellor Blake herself. Um, this year, um, what our big advocacy work has been is surrounding uh, the COVID nineteen student relief fund. Um, oh, I talk a lot. Okay, never mind. Thank you. 
Uh, and next to uh, Brian. Can you, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for the question. So I had mentioned before, for over the last three decades, I've worked within many community-based settings where I've dedicated my life to the service of those that are most marginalized and vulnerable in our community. I'm currently working for the UW-Madison Odyssey Project where I am the success coach and their social worker. I serve well over 580 Odyssey students, many whom struggle to pay the rent or they're worried about how they're gonna put food on the table. So I wanna tell you at times as a 61 year old black man, as a father of five who's worked low income jobs most of my life, when I looked into the mirror, I saw the face of poverty. I too struggled to pay the rent to care for my children while sending them to schools in Madison. So this has given me real live life experiences that has made me an effective advocate and I believe an effective alder in the past. I carry these thousands of people in my heart as I go into this service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next we'll go to Charlie. Brian, you are so chill. It's hard for somebody as hyper as me to follow you. <laughs> um, but I have really always um, had a heart for my hometown. I am from Eastside Madison. I grew up here and I just tipped that scale of being 23 years, I think back on the East Side versus 22 years um, in the Pacific Northwest in Texas. Um, my time back here is when I really began to start this cathartic journey for myself of just needing to help others through what I was going through. I found myself, um, it was four years ago, this last um, St. Patrick's Day and this upcoming May, um, back to back, I found myself losing my voice due to somebody from Madison's opioid crisis and being a victim of the Madison police. And I'm just gonna say at this point, go to my website, my journey's there, but um, my community roots and love is strong. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, Patrick. Thanks. Uh, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks about being an activist in Virginia. And uh, part of that was that for 10 years, I chaired Virginia's statewide LGBTQ advocacy organization. And that, that definitely informs who I am now and, and how I approach being an alder. Uh, Virginia was super conservative back then and dominated by the religious right. And our primary allies in the struggle were black elected officials and black folk in Appalachia who were fighting environmental racism. We were all friends and allies and together we learned about intersectionality and that really informs how I approach being alder today. And then uh, since, since being in Madison uh, and being a neighborhood activist, uh, I learned about affordable housing and what we can and can't do here in Wisconsin in that regard. And I learned how regressive our state legislature is and how they've limited us. And I learned a lot about how we must be creative and continually poke holes in the barriers they put up for us. And uh, that was just as an activist, but it de definitely informs how I approach being an alder too. Excellent. Um, now I'll hand it off to Andrea for the next question. I'm mute here. Okay. So uh, question, the second question is, um, and I'll be starting with Patrick. Police accountability is a major issue in city government. What policies will you advocate for as an elected official to address the various ways in which this issue address, affects our community? And starting with Patrick. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I'll continue to uh, advocate for the police independent monitor position and the civilian oversight board as I, I did in the last year or two as this was being formulated. Uh, 
we need to make sure they have appropriate training, empower them, and we need to continue to clarify how their roles intersect with other uh, bodies that, that have purview with regard to the police, the Police and Fire Commission and the PSRC Public Safety Review Committee that I sit on. Uh, I think we need to continue to expand uh, all sorts of community-based responses to uh, public safety issues and, and concerns so we can reduce our need for, for funding police responses. Uh, we need to find ways for the city and the community to fund education, healthcare, transit needs, food access, and housing opportunities for dis disenfranchised communities. If we do that, we can address the root causes of crime first, rather than having to have a gigantic public safety apparatus in the form of the police. All right, thank you very much. And next up, um, we have Charlie Rook. Yes, um, I'm, I know some of the alders who are currently serving here were on Common Council when I presented my personal story um, and my battle with transparency in our police department, the need for it. Um, they heard my testimony when I had to fight just to have my voice as a victim be heard. And um, having the community oversight board is a beautiful step, but having um, a real accountability for where our police officers are and are they doing what we want them to be doing um, is something that we really have to take a look at. It's really sad. One of the reasons I stepped up was seeing in my district an alder who called for defunding at a time that she wanted to increase her salary, but then she stayed silent when protesters needed her to step up and vote. And I just wanna be in office to take that stand. Thank you, that's great. Um, all right, next up, uh, we have Brian Brentford. Sorry, I kind of choked on your last name there, but Brian, you're out. Brian okay, Brentford. thank you. I was, sorry, having problems on muting. So for me, truth telling is what's needed most as we reimagine public safety you, we all understand that under the umbrella of any conversation on reimagining public safety, we, we just got to reckon with the truth that if we as a city, a society, want to eliminate the horrendous racial disparities within our criminal justice system, if we find the prison industrial complex abhorrent, then we cannot escape the fact that none of these realities would exist without the current system of policing. Both the prison industrial complex and policing as we know it are self-serving institutions, resistant to change despite the human carnage they both contribute to. I look forward to complete community control and how we reimagine policing. I also look forward to taking opportunities to acknowledge our good public servants within public safety. I have faith that Madison can become a model for others because of all the committed advocates and activists within our midst, many here tonight. I will dedicate myself to bringing us together so that we can all feel safe and we can all reach our full potentials. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Um, just a second, sorry, lost my timer. There we go. All right, so uh, next up we have uh, Juliana. Sweet. For public safety, like Brian said, when we're talking about reimagining public safety, like public safety means education. Public safety means mental health services. Public safety um, means ac um, access to the community needs. I'm really um, thankful to have co-authored the CAHOOTS legislation that recently passed in ASM so District 8 constituents can be opted in to the city's piloted CAHOOTS program. And we need to expand um, the CAHOOTS or crisis response team. Um, 
in Madison Common Council. We need to meet OIR report recommendation number 141 to have a um, independent monitor. Um, and like Brian said, complete community control over public safety. Um, and I will be an outspoken advocate as I have been in the past for that. Thank you. Uh, all right, and next up, Ayumi. Oh, I was already unmuted. <laughs> awesome. Um, impact demand, uh, it was instrumental in getting the civilian oversight board as one of our demands is community control. And I would be, you know, an advocate for the work that they that needs to be done um, in that regard. Um, I've spoken with the new police chief and personally, I will always be advocating to fire Matt Kenny and to take up the 177 suggestions of the ad hoc committee and the OIR reports, which I finally finished reading this summer. <laughs> The police fundamentally cannot protect and serve a community which they fear. Their presence alone is harmful. And so reimagining public safety to me means, you know, having the cahoots model, which I'm so glad is moving forward within the city, um, but also investing in transportation, affordable housing. But with this amazing cohort, I think we can go a little bit further. How about we make them green? Electric buses and sustainable housing is something that I'm a huge supporter of. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and next we have um, Nikki. Uh, Nikki wasn't able to make it. Oh, sorry. I, had, I was thinking. I think it's going to be me. Wondering what I heard. I heard it. Yes, Tessa, you're right. <laughs> um, at this point. I've memorized the district orders uh, <laughs> or associated the faces of the districts. Um, so yes, I think that one of the things um, that's crucial is like usually when people talk about uh, reforming the police, right? Changing the police, what we're talking about is throwing more money at the police, right? We talk about body cameras, we talk about more training, we talk about all these things, um, which is the exact opposite of what communities are actually asking for. They're asking for that money to be taken away from the police and given to other people, given to mental health services, given to um, addressing the root causes of homelessness, giving to um, programs that we see work. So I guess just I've said variations of this many times over the last couple of months, but I'm gonna focus on the fact that in District 12, a couple of days ago, um, there was a shooting at the temporary men's homeless shelter and the police responded. Um, and they made all the residents stand out in the cold for hours and there was an asthma attack and someone almost died because the police were not helping and they also were refusing to let other people help um, who were there and that, just amplifies to me the problem that we're seeing um, the Madison Police Department and clearly needs to be addressed uh, immediately, right? There need to be different response um, teams. Oh, minute goes fast, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, next up is Grant. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is, um, I think for a lot of folks that aren't on council right now, um, dealing with the, the um, limits of our power when we're faced with some um, federal and state constraints. This is one of those areas. So qualified immunity and our uh, PFC model that we have in Wisconsin really tie our hands in regards to accountability for police. So as others have mentioned, the COB is you know probably our best opportunity locally to um, try and drive some accountability. But um, you know that's really just dealing with the um, after effects and it really doesn't address um, the problems that are having happening in the first place. So when we think about uh, reform and it's, it's well beyond police reform, it's the whole carceral system and it's really capitalism itself because the, the primary purpose of policing and prisons is to, is to manage this gross inequality. Um, so, you know, we, we can talk about accountability for uh, police actions that are damaging to individuals, but it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of um, what's underneath that. And I think that's where we need to really keep our focus. Thank you. All right, and Rebecca? Um, 
Yeah, I've been working on this since before I got elected. Um, and it's, it's something that I will always work on whether in office or not. Um, the, the independent monitor position is really critical for any kind of reform. That person will uh, has, the, has the specific charge of overseeing the implementation of those 177 recommendations, which were, you know, so much time and effort and energy were put into them. And those recommendations have been adopted as policy. So those are policy now. And the council has told the MPD, you have to do these things. There's some really, really important one recommendations around use of force, around de-escalation training, um, and with the with the independent monitor, that person has access to all of the police data and information. We we worked really hard to defend that section in the ordinance to make sure that that person would have subpoena power. They can have access to everything, and I really hope that that will bring in a new day of transparency um, because as Charlie said it's been they have acted with impunity in our community um, for too long and, and we really really need the public to have access thank you all right and for the next question pass it off to Dave thanks okay so uh, for this question we'll start again with Rebecca uh, transportation is an important issue that affects sustainability, affordability, and quality of life. What policies will you advocate for to improve transportation in our community? And we'll start with Rebecca. It's a little intense having to do back to back like this, I have to say. <laughs> um, so this is also an issue I've been working on for my whole time uh, on council. And for transportation, we, re we need to get, we need to build a system uh, where it's, where your last, your last choice is to take a single occupancy vehicle. We need to build a transportation system and, and community amenities to where people can walk or bike to most of the things they need or get decent transit access. That's what we really need to be aiming for, for the, um, for the planet, um, but also just for communities, for safer communities, because we know that you know the biggest, the highest number of deaths and injuries don't come from crime in Madison. They come from traffic. They come from cars crashing into things. So we really need to um, do what we can to invest in uh, ped and bike infrastructure so that all ages and ability can do uh, can can do so comfortably, and in our transit system, not just BRT, but ensure that our transit reaches, especially those who are transit dependent um, in districts like mine, which are outlying. So we have to really drive resources to those who, who need it. And then, Time. okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the question next goes to Grant. Thanks. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this was one of the, um, this was my introduction into city government and I've continued to work on it since I um, came on as alder. I'm on the Transportation Commission Policy and Planning Board and any other transportation body you can find. I've um, been very happy to have Rebecca as a colleague in, in this work. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's all about um, making walking, biking and transit the, the best choices for more people. And so we've got kind of three key initiatives rolling right now that we really um, spearheaded, uh, got them approved a couple of years ago, and we're finally getting into the meat of them right now. So that is uh, Complete and Green Streets, which is really um, going to give us the opportunity to actually set policy around how we divide up this, the space in the right of way. So where we, where we want to have buses, where we want to have bike lanes, how wide of sidewalks we want. Um, the second one is Vision Zero, which is really focused on eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries. As Rebecca said, there, there are more deaths and, and serious injuries from cars and from any other purpose in, in the city. And then the third one is uh, BRT and our transit redesign work. So really uh, getting to the next level with our transit system so that more people can have real access um, via bus. Thank you. Uh, so next, the question goes to Tessa. Yes, yeah. Um, 
I would like to thank Rebecca and Grant both for all the work they've done on this and all the programs that, that Grant just mentioned. Um, I know for myself, I can't take a bus to work currently. It would be about three buses and then three miles of walking um, because there's just no options, right? And so we need to look at where people are commuting and what neighborhoods they live in and come up with the solutions to, to actually big, bring public transit accessible to everyone in Madison. Um, and when we look at that, I mean, I would love to see light rail, but obviously city council doesn't have control over that. Um, <laughs> it's just a dream. On the other side of that, right, on top of all of the things that have already been mentioned about changing these programs, changing the way we use the access, making places walkable, affordable, I think we need to look at um, telecommuting, uh, alternate ways of working, right, encourage people to be able to have different ways uh, that don't require you to go into an office constantly. Obviously, some people always will have to work on location, but not everybody. I think that's my time. Thank you. So uh, next, the question will go to Juliana. Sweet. So <clears throat> kind of like what Tessa was saying, um, we need transportation and we need to look at it as another vehicle to provide job opportunities and affordable housing. Um, because, and I can speak from like personal experience, um, when I lived, um, when I lived on Monroe Street, the commute for me to get to work was 40 minutes. I had to take two buses. And if I had missed that bus, then I was out of luck and would have to Uber to work. So that is not good. And I actually like eventually like left the job because it was just like infeasible for me to work at that location. So we need um, transportation, um, we need free buses. We need increased transportation, especially in um, the south side, southwest side of Madison, places that don't currently have the infrastructure or currently have um, enough transportation. Um, like Rebecca was referring to, you know, increased access to um, bike lanes and um, other forms of transportation. But at the end of the day, I'm excited to really partner with um, Rebecca and Grant because I understand that out of all the candidates here, they're probably like the biggest transportation geeks. And I love that. So um, that's where I stand with transportation. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the question next goes to Iomi. Um, so like there was mentioned before, um, Madison has so many bikes and trails and I call it a very granola crunchy uh, city uh, because it, it's what makes us unique. It was, it's something that draws people in. And so I want to encourage the work that's already being done there. I think we can be expanded a little bit further. I would love to see football energy down State Street, electric buses. I support free bus routes and also um, especially to services like um, hospitals. Um, as someone that used to take a bus from my house to school like an hour away um, every morning, uh, while I was in high school, I think it's really important that youth interact with green energy every day so that we think outside the box and think green um, to have more creative and innovative solutions that we're seeing coming out of Rebecca and Grant. And I want to see um, more people spearhead innovative solutions such as those. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brian. Thanks. I, I promise I won't call Rebecca and Grant geeks. Uh, I'll be the geek tonight. <laughs> That's okay, Julia. <laughs> so, you know, maybe I'm the oldest person uh, tonight on this call. So being a boomer, I was firmly planted within a car culture that has led to our dependency on fossil fuels and roads. Uh, we really do have to think about moving people safely, comfortably, and efficiently and most climate friendly from point A to B. So everything that I will do around transportation will be looked through an equity lens. And uh, just to echo and piggyback what other people have said that we do need a regionally integrated public transportation system that does include uh, accessible inner, inner city bus station with easy connections and other forms of transport. 
And I do believe that uh, there should be fair, free and fully accessible 24 seven transportation services. I mentioned before that I've served the most marginalized and vulnerable and as they're trying to get to work and without cars and uh, I'm a, I, I'm a bikey true and through, but I realize it doesn't work for a lot of the folks that I serve. So we do need to uh, really work for assistance from employers to really give employees incentives to try alternatives to uh, driving and uh, find other ways to move people safely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next is, uh, sorry about that. Uh, next up is um, Charlie. Yes, thank you. This is um, one of my most favorite questionnaires to fill out through this entire process was for Madison Bikes because they reminded me of growing up on the east side on my banana seat and being able to get around whether it was to the pool or to school or to play with my friends. And sadly, this is something, this transportation and sustainability for community issues is really near and dear. If you look at the maps, um, the east side has been missing um, a lot in our new maps for whether it's been for buses, for bike routes, or for um, all of these new, um, not new, but necessary and newly introduced transportation methods that our common council is um, you know, committing to. This is really something that we want to see extend to the east side. There is a bridge, a bicycle bridge at um, 51 and Milwaukee Street, and our bike paths come right to there. And it has a sign that points over, but they stop there. And I want to fight for our east side to get these things as well. Thank you. Uh, and Patrick. Thanks. Uh, one of the more uh, obscure bodies that I sit on is the Greater Madison Transportation Policy Board. And this, this board deals with regional transportation policy and funding, so bigger than the city of Madison. And uh, you know, this, this past year sitting on that, the, the board, which is a pretty large body, voted to add this shoulder running Beltline lane, essentially expanding the capacity of the Beltline. And, Grant and I are both on that board and he and I and, and another person voted no. And I don't remember the vote, it was 13 to three or something, but you know, we have got to stop expanding our freeway capacity if we're ever gonna meet our net zero carbon emissions goals and, and to reduce our reliance on vehicles and, and promote expansion of, of, of uh, pedestrian and, and bike infrastructure and increasing safety and uh, somehow we've got to get through to people that that's where we've got to spend our money, not on expanding highways. Um, I'm a, I, I have always been a strong supporter of Vision Zero and Complete Streets and BRT. And, and sitting on Plan Commission, uh, you know, we're, we're also really focusing on promoting development along transit corridors instead of in places that will never have a feasible bus uh, system. Uh, I think the, the network redesign study that's going on uh, for the bus is a super important effort too. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over uh, to Sam for the next question. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so the next question uh, is PFAS and other water balloons threaten our safety and the quality of our environment. What would you propose to keep our water clean? And uh, we'll start with Patrick. Thanks, Sam. Uh, well, first of all, we've got to have absolute transparency in all of our water quality testing and results, and not just at the water utility, but at the county and state levels too. Uh, that, that needs to be all uh, done often and in full view of everyone. Uh, we, and, and that needs to relate to the water that we drink, that we fish in or otherwise interact in. And one of the, one of the most important things and with regard to PFAS is, I, I think as always, I'll continue to oppose the F-35 uh, bed down at Truax, but you know, not only could they inject uh, 
new pollutants into our air and our water, but the construction of the infrastructure required for their deployment at Truax is, is a super high risk for disturbing existing PFAS hotspots and plumes. And so F-35 infrastructure uh, construction needs to be stopped. Uh, Sam, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, next, we'll take the question to Charlie. Yes, the, this is something that, um, as a candidate, you know, you go down a lot of rabbit holes really fast to catch up to things. And this is one of those things that I learned that we have already been ordered as a city um, with a couple other entities, including the National Guard here. We were ordered, I believe it was back in 1987 to clean up Starkweather Creek, to clean up these PFAS, to clean up the leaching contaminants. And unfortunately, they um, have only invested a certain amount into an experimental, let's call it a bacterial mat that the DNR has already told us isn't working. and we're not being active. We are fighting for all the right things. Um, some of them, it's just a matter of mitigating now um, the F-35s and mitigating what's already been done. But as um, Alder Heck said, we know that it's gonna shake up what's there. And I think that part of what the city needs to do is really commit to the promises we made and see what can be done to mitigate um, the shakeup from happening. Excellent. And next, uh, uh, we'll go to Brian. Thanks, Sam. I don't mean to be overly dramatic, but uh, holy buckets, once again, some truth telling is in order. So we can all say water is life. Clean water should be a fundamental right. Currently, we have political leaders pointing fingers elsewhere. City points at the county, counties pointing at the military, DNR is pointing at all of them rather than admit that we have this horrendous problem and begin to work to remediate this and city is forever chemicals from our waters and soils, uh, we, we, we just really need to hold policymakers accountable to demand immediate work on cleaning up rather than hiding because of the liability and cost that, of the cleanups. We know that these would be hundreds of millions of dollars to get this out of our waterway and our soils. So we do this by teaming up together, folks on this call, and we come together to heighten the level of awareness around this issue with the public to demand action. So I know it's all interrelated. F-35s, these insidious weapons of mass destruction tied in with environmental injustices. We, we have to do better. And I believe all of us on this panel will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next, we'll take the question to Iomi. Yeah, transparency and accountability is the name of the game here. We definitely need to take more action. It's our sole job to protect and serve our community as alders. Um, and so I hope that people, you know, take it accountability and transportation or transparency and hold their representatives accountable and make sure that it's a priority, especially when we know um, things like this disproportionately affects BIPOC uh, members and uh, community members, especially when you can't afford a Brita filter or whatever. Um, it's important. And I think that it's, it's important for everyone to mobilize their community to know about what's going on with PFAS and to get involved and go to public hearings. But at the end of the I'm at the end of the day, take action. Definitely. Uh, next up is Juliana. Um, yeah, I mean, taking it from there, just, just like Brian said, you know, accountability and, you know, taking that a step further, we got to be really looking at how this disproportionately affects um, people of color. I find it, you know, if you look at the proposal, I find it actually kind of crazy that the F-35s is will disproportionately affect neighborhoods of color. And I really wonder if that were hap if it were um, affecting predominantly white neighborhoods, if we would have stronger opposition to F-35s. 
you know, why do we think it's okay to allow them in an area that's will disproportionately affect uh, minority neighborhoods. So uh, for our water quality, one opposing F35s, that's what we all need to do. Um, and also, and this is specific to District 8, um, ensuring proper leaf removal, reduce salt, salt usage in the winter and making sure that um, um, we have, we're not, um, excuse me, holding um, developers accountable and not allowing runoff into um, our lakes which is a significant problem um, in District 8. So um, those are the ways that I am, am working for um, water quality. Excellent. Uh, next up is Tessa. Yeah, so like I said in my opening statements, this is one of the issues that, that drove me to run for city council. Um, me and all of my neighbors were drinking well 15 water until they shut it down because of PFAS contamination. We, I was just last week in a neighborhood meeting and we were talking about um, how do we collect information about health risks that people are experiencing because of these toxic chemicals and looking at these other places around the country that have sued or done other things. Um, and it's just depressing to think that we're already at the point where we're like, all right, well, in 10 years, when everyone starts getting cancer, um, how do we how do we go back? And I would love <laughs> for us to be able to stop it before it gets there, right? Madison doesn't need to go down that path. Um, and so obviously like stop the F-35s, we, there's no way uh, to prevent if they come here, the fact that PFAS chemicals will rise in our drinking water, will rise in Stark Redder Creek, will rise in our environment and our lake levels. That is just an inevitability that will happen if F-35s come here. Uh, oh, that's my time, okay. <laughs> Excellent answer. Uh, next up is Grant. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the Well 15 issue kind of broke open when I was running just over two years ago. And um, I actually worked really hard um, during that time to really try and push water utility to, to make a shift in how they were approaching this topic with the public, because early on in particular, they seem to be putting a lot of energy into trying to minimize the concerns. I think some of it was, you know, well-intended. They didn't want to scare the public, um, but it was having very much the opposite effect and it was just inappropriate. Um, and so as you know, when I, when I got into office, I had a number of conversations and I think did, did actually help move the bar with them to realize you know, minimizing this to the community is not the answer here. You need to be fully transparent. We need to share all the information we have. Um, we had additional meetings, especially out at like in the Truax neighborhood where there's a lot of folks that actually fish out of the stark weather and eat those fish. Um, a lot of nursing mothers there. And so we got, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> that's a minute. All right, you guys have to give us more time in the future with these kind of big questions. I'll finish your sentence, Grant. Uh, we got public health to put signs up, <laughs> but those signs aren't enough. They weren't. They weren't a strong enough. Um, they weren't a strong enough warning. And um, I'm going to say that our public health department can do a lot more. They can do a, lo a lot more testing of the sediments, testing of the fish, um, get continually. Um, which they haven't done. Like it, it was ridiculous when we were working on this two years ago. Like how how much resistance our own public health department put up to just testing and they have the resources like they are literally the scientists and they can do it and and they just they resisted so i think from the city level that's what we really need to do is push on our public health department to actually protect the public health of the public um and and um do the testing put up the warnings do the do the uh communication to the community and, um, oh, 10 seconds left, I'm done. And now I have to answer another question right away. You guys, you should like rotate it in a different way next time. This is really bad for me and Patrick. Okay, thanks for the feedback. <laughs> um, you can take it and give her a break. <laughs> no, 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 let's do it. All right, okay, I'll go ahead. Um, so the next question is, 
What is your opinion on the advisory questions on the April 6th ballot regarding changes that would take place beginning in the 2023 um, spring election? And I've abbreviated these a little bit, but the, the essence is there in it, each of them. So this is gonna take a minute to, to read, give you a break, Rebecca. Um, Madison currently has a part-time common council with members who are paid approximately $13,700 per year. Should the city of Madison transition to a full-time common council with each co common council member earning between 50% and 80% of the adjusted median income for Dane County for a single parent with two children, approximately 45 to 71,000 per year? And the second question is Madison currently has a part-time common council uh, compri comprised of 20 alder persons, one from each alder person district, should the size of the city of Madison Common Council be reduced, be increased, or remain the same? The third question there is Madison Alder Persons are currently elected to two two-year terms. Should the city of Madison Alder Persons be elected to four-year terms? Uh, I said two two-year terms, sorry. That was just, it's in the wording of the question, but a single two-year term. Should that be changed to four-year term? Uh, Madison Alder Persons are currently not subject to term limits. Should the city of Madison um, alder persons be sub subject to term limits of 12 consecutive years. And that's it. So Rebecca, shoot. Okay, we only have one minute to answer this. So I'm gonna say on, um, I'm gonna spend my time on the, on the first question. On question number four, yes. Question number three, yes. Question number two should stay the same or be expanded. But question number one, I was on TFOGS that um, studied this. And at the beginning of TFOGS, I was like, no way should we, and first of all, I don't like the, the, the term full, full time. Um, for me, this is a question about compensation, compensating people for their work. And at first I was like, no way should we have, you know, full-time alders, it's a public service. Um, it's a, you know, it's a service position and people should just do it because of, you know, public service, not as, as a career, or as a job. But then when we looked into the data and saw how exclusive the club of alders is how so many people, working parents, people who don't have flexible jobs are excluded from doing this and why, um, I started to change my mind and thinking that, yeah, you know, if people could be compensated for the work of doing an alder, then it wouldn't just be people who are retired, who have super flexible jobs, who are independently wealthy um, or who have super supportive families that can do it it can be opened up to more people. So for me, this is about um, worker, worker respecting the work of the job. Thank you. I realize it's a lot to deal with uh, in just a minute. All right, uh, same question to Grant. I see you've posted a link to your yeah. thoughts on the referendum. Yeah, so the task force got two years to work on it. We get 60 seconds. Um, so yeah, I, I shared some of my thoughts on these questions. I'm interested can take a look there. Um, I'll also focus on the first question and do everything that Rebecca said. I was also very much like, no way, we do not want, we want, we want community service minded folks. We do not want sort of career politicians. And over the course of those two years, um, also changed my mind. And in particular, the last two years of doing this job, um, all the things that Rebecca said, but I also want to point out at the end of the day, it's not about the elders at all. It's not about um, you know, what, what they deserve or what we deserve. It's about what do people want from their representatives. I said earlier that the people that have the power in this community know exactly what they want and are putting their money, their power into getting and expanding what they want. And alders are the way that the people can get what they want. And so if, do you, if you don't want a professional to do that work for you, then don't pay them for it. But when people say we don't want professional politicians, I don't know what work you want done by somebody that's not a politician, but trust me, you want the best people you can possibly get in these positions because it's the only way we're gonna we're gonna express our power as a community. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Tessa. Um, yeah, I think it's really hard for the general public to know the answers to these questions. Um, <laughs> I think in general, uh, term limits, yes. Um, I'm more in favor of two-year terms and four-year terms because I think it's already hard for students or renters who might be moving between districts um, to engage in city politics. So I'm in favor and also the accountability of going through re-election. Um, 
in terms of the size stay the same or increase i think this is a really misleading thing because it kind of leads you to think if you pay alders correctly for their work then you have to decrease the size of the council they're equating them um and they don't need to be but i think that um oh i think voters should have the decision i just think it's hard to have an opinion i guess as someone running who hasn't been on council to be like this is what i think should happen um uh for the for the pay i mean i think that it should be available for oh <laughs> um for people how do i say this and my time's already gone um so for me i couldn't put my income up at risk every two years on an election um and so i think in some ways if it's the only job it um can be limiting but i also think that it, you need to pay people for the work that you want to see, and we need to see more work from our city council. We need to see more um, resources put into them so that they can do more work for us. And I kind of think of time. Other, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. So, anyway, uh, all right. So, moving on to Ayomi. Yeah, um, I've been speaking out about this lately, so I'm excited. Um, but in term, I'll start from the bottom up since that seems to be a common thread. Uh, you know, in terms of 12 years, yes. Um, two years, I would say, also remain the same or increase. Um, you know, when we're talking about talk the budget really and or and expanding, um, you know. The wage that we would get, I think that it is a disservice to yourself if you think you're coming in um, thinking it's a part-time position because it is a full-time job uh, for most people and it's hard to do that and be a student and be working and so increasing the pay does um, help in terms of compensate compensation and you know I'm for having you know appropriate wages for any job that you do. I think it's important that the ones Ayanna Presley said closest to the pain should be closest to the power. And I feel um, as though as the youngest candidate, we have to keep our student voice. And so that's my priority. And those are my answers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Juliana. Yeah, so like after hearing some of y'all's responses, I think we need to have a conversation, but um, because I, one term limits, yes, there shouldn't be people, I don't know why you want to be on council for longer than 12 years anyways. Um, uh, I think we should increase the amount of alders, no to um, full time, no to four year terms. And I'm gonna tell you this because I like hope we can recognize that like, I literally, we, a student could not run for Alder, I couldn't, a student could not be on Alder and we, we would be essentially wiping out the young person's voice on Common Council if it, be, if it becomes, if we make these changes because a full-time student by definition cannot take on the position as a full-time Alder and for a four-year term. So I am um, staunchly against this, uh, I'm against um, it becoming full-time and for four-year terms. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Brian. So, thanks a lot. There's uh, parts of the referendum proposals that I really like, for example, term limits for both the council and the mayor. So, I, I feel a little different. I applaud increasing the terms to four years because you see, as a former alder, you do your due diligence, you serve for a year, then you have to ramp up campaigning again. It's really hard to gain traction on big initiatives with uh, such short terms. So here's the thing, if the intent of some of these proposals is to open doors for more BIPOC and other underrepresented people to serve, then I would respectfully say all it would take is for white people to step aside and let others serve. We don't need to artificially restructure the council to achieve this goal. And you know, I'm repulsed thinking about 10 full-time paid alders. Already the power of incumbency makes it almost impossible to beat a sitting alder in an election and the cost to run for public office will skyrocket even more than the current distressing levels. Reducing the council to me is counter to democracy. Local government within our neighborhoods, our backyards are vitally important 
in a day where we have tremendous disconnect between policymakers and all of those that they serve at every level. So that's my short answer and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. All right, uh, Charlie. Thank you. I um, have been very outspoken on this. This is something that when I got my nominations knocking door to door was an issue presented to me. Um, I agree with Brian that there are so many people using some of the things that the TFOG has recommended as a racial justice um, platform, but as the poster child for systemic racism and injustice in Madison, I committed my first $1,200 of my stimulus to my campaign. My donations have purely come from my community and people who support me. And I would challenge even some of the elders who are sitting here now saying that we're fighting for the same things. We want the same conversations. You've endorsed my opponent. She is somebody who is no doubt a part of the machine that my district is fighting against. We want that representation. I welcome you to co-endorse me because we're sitting here saying we want the same things. We need the representation. And like Tessa said, reducing the size doesn't mean we're not paid well for our representing. Thank you. All right, uh, next up, Patrick. Uh, thanks. I'm going to start with the last question uh, first about term limits. Uh, I'm generally not in favor of term limits of any type. I think voters should toss out those that they don't think are doing a good job. But uh, that said, until we have publicly financed elections, which is, I think, really what we need with no outside money coming in at all, then uh, if we had that combined with reasonable alder pay to level and broaden the candidate field, uh, you know, if we're not going to have that, I might be convinced to su support term limits. So it's not written in stone. I agree that the four year terms are better for because I know I've, I've served for two years and the better part of one year was ramping up and uh, I've barely had a full year of trying to actually get things done and you're running for reelection if you so desire. I think we should have at least 20 alders and uh, in terms of pay. Uh, I, uh, I believe that we need to compensate people if we want to have lower income, younger folks, uh, people with children and less flexibility and things to have access to the job. Thank you. All right, so on to Sam for the next question. And Patrick, you'll be up again. Sorry, I should leave that to Sam. Um, I think. Sorry, uh, is it you, Dave? I yeah. I think I was up yeah. next. Yeah. And, Sorry. Uh, yeah. So we've gone through a lot of our questions tonight because of time. Um, we are going to roll our last question into the closing statement, but uh, it should work out pretty well. And um, all right. So the uh, the last question was how can residents help you push for the policies we've talked about tonight? Uh, because we do want to get the community involved. And um, if, if you could just roll that into your closing statement. And again, we have you know one minute for the closing statement. And I know, um, you know we could talk for a lot longer on many of these issues. So, so thanks for um, bearing with us uh, and I will go uh, first to Patrick. Thanks. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that I think is, is super undervalued is getting involved on boards, committees, and commissions. That's a really important thing that all parts of the community that watch, want change need to do. It's great to give public comment and it, 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 it definitely influences things, but I would recommend talking to alders about what committees have uh, influence and have vacancies and need your great ideas to help form policies. So that's my recommendation. Uh, and otherwise, I'd say, uh, um, you know, I, I've really enjoyed these conversations and I'm learning things tonight that I didn't know and, and hearing the perspectives of all the candidates uh, has, has been fantastic. So I'm, I'm really glad we got to spend this time together. And I look forward to working with many of you uh, 
in uh, what I hope is my second term. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, next up is Charlie. Yes, I, um, I love the idea that Patrick just put forth. There are so many vacancies and so many committees in Madison right now. And there are committees that are inactive. And I know personally though that um, being, you know, neurodivergent and an extremely socially anxious person, it's not always easy to step into those political positions. It's one of the reasons as a community activist and organizers, I want to encourage my community to get involved in conversations. You know, we can have these safe spaces, like I believe as Iomi said, um, Tessa has been instrumental. She's created safe spaces that I've been a part of like FemFest and other LGBTQ spaces. We can create them. We can have challenging conversations like this. Um, I think we've all learned that community is essential and through community involvement, um, whether it's allowing somebody to plug in a refrigerator for your homeless neighbors, there's ways that we can begin to progress Madison to become the um, place that we want it to be. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next up is Brian. Thanks again for putting us on. It's been great to be with everybody. So I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, the Greens offer us an alternative to the insanity that's currently our two party system. We have all come together tonight because we do share the common bonds of grassroots democracy, social justice and equal opportunity, ecological wisdom, nonviolence, decentralization, community based economics, feminism and gender equity respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, future focus and sustainability. I know those sound familiar. Those are the 10 key values of the Green Party. So now more than ever, we do need political leaders that can bring diverse people together in unity, respect and love to forge a new safe, socially just and equitable Madison. So as you're all there, I will help us as a community to reimagine public safety, fight for real affordable housing, create pathways for sustainable jobs that pay a living wage, and to ensure that everybody, everybody in Madison has opportunities to reach their full potentials. So that's how you can get involved. We all come together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the shout out to the Green Party's 10 key values. I love that. Um, next up is Iomi. So at the end of the day, the policies that I'm fighting for are important to me because this is my home. Um, the social and environmental ideas that I'm ready to bring forth day one um, are fueled by the community. I'm rooted here and I plan on increasing community control. When elected, I will become a bridge between the greater Madison community and UW. And I understand that I will still be on the grounds and in office being unapologetically myself, being unapologetically a black woman and progressive. And if you want to do something and get involved right now, uh, you can donate and plant a tree because we're already doing the work that we want to see done um, come April 6th. And so, yeah, go donate or um, follow us at Iomi for Alder on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our website is Iomi for the number four alder dot vote thank you so much for having me thank you uh, next up is juliana um yeah well i just want to give a, a big shout out to everyone here um to all my fellow candidates and hopefully eventually fellow um people that i'll be working with um so <laughs> and you know i kind of echo what um charlie was saying like we have a really awesome cohort of BIPOC candidates. And I said this in uh, the Just Staying Conversations, we need to be putting our full force behind these BIPOC candidates because um, if we're not, then we're standing in the way of progress. And you know, how are we gonna call ourselves progressive if we're not sticking to the values of like having uh, progressive BIPOC candidates on council? So um, I really want to just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your support um, that we've received. I know that like in our campaign, we've literally um, built a coalition of civically engaged young people and people are engaging in our uh, politics in District 8 that haven't before. 
and I know that we will continue to do so um, once on council. Great, thank you very much. Um, so next up is Tessa. I'm gonna be honest, I completely forgot the question, but- um... <laughs> so, uh, Just, yeah, real quick, and this won't count for your time, is how, um, how can residents get involved uh, and help push for the policies we've talked about tonight uh, together with your closing statement? Got you. Um, so yeah, I mean, as a, as a socialist and a community organizer, I'm gonna always say, go to the streets, take to the streets. <laughs> I'm gonna say the powers that be will only uh, respond uh, to power. Um, and what we have is people power. So when we have people who are sympathetic uh city on city council what they need is mass groups of voices coming out and supporting them uh, because behind those closed doors are lobbyists and money and developers and telling them no um and so we need people to show up in mass on the streets um uh, and to council meetings and all those things i know it feels like you're not doing anything when you're saying your statements to the county board about don't build the new jail over and over again but we've actually gained more county board members that are against it like those things do do take effect so um and join a third party right we need third parties in this country so thank you for having me thanks some people say a second party would do um <laughs> uh grant awesome yeah i mean i think it's Everybody's different, right? So some people are, are um, I think it'd be unrealistic to expect everybody's gonna participate in the same kind of way. Um, fundamentally, please do make sure you're voting. And I'm assuming people that are watching this probably are, but like check with your friends and family. I mean, I know it seems like a simple thing, but it's like a quarter of the people that even vote for the president vote for city alder race. So like make sure people know about this and everybody's voting, um, hold people accountable. Um, I think also like do work in your community, even if it's not on this like city stuff, just get involved with your neighborhood association, get to know your neighbors, do just do volunteer projects around your hood and like be active. Don't watch TV, just do positive things for your home and your neighborhood and your community because nobody's going to do it for you. Start participating where you're at and just keep doing it. Thank you. Okay. And last but not least, Rebecca. Um, yeah, do what Grant says. Also, if you have an idea, if you have, there's something, a passion, something you're working on, contact your alder, contact one of us and let's work on it together. Cause like I said, we don't like, I don't have all the answers. Like none of us have all the answers, but we need to hear from you. If you have a bold idea that you want to get um, in front of the city, let's do it. Let's do it together. Um, when I got cut off in my opening statement, I, I was saying that uh, some of us were together talking about um, affordable housing, like how to really, really make an impact on, on affordable housing. And like, we have to go big. We have to go bold. We can't be afraid. We can't say, oh, you know, just $10 million. We need to really, if it's a priority, we need to invest if that means borrow, if that means lobby the federal government to, you know, open those taps from the Fed and, you know, do do some more, you know, make some more money, rain on communities. We need to do that because we, that's, anyway, sorry. sorry. No, 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 go ahead. It's just great being with all you people who I know are ready to be bold. It's awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, wow. So we're already at the end of our time um, and we only went five minutes over uh, and it's been such a great discussion tonight. Um, we are hoping to make the, the video available on our Wisconsin Green Party YouTube channel. So again, folks who weren't able to be here with us live are still able to benefit uh, from this discussion and um, yeah, uh, thank you so much to all of our candidates for spending the time with us tonight. Um, everyone, 
Remember to get your absentee ballot. Uh, make sure to vote by Tuesday, April 6th, um, if not before. Uh, and remember to look up everything that's going to be on your ballot. We also have those ballot advisory questions. Uh, a lot to think about from that tonight. Um, so yeah, um, we'll let folks get back to their Friday night. But again, uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. It's been great. And um, let's go win some council seats. <laughs>